Right now on Morning News Now, panic in Gaza as hundreds of thousands flee ahead of the threat of an Israeli invasion. The fighting in Rafah has intensified. We've got the latest on the ground as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu faces new resistance from within his own country. Also this morning, courtroom face-off. Michael Cohen set to testify in the hush money trial of his former boss, Donald Trump. What the former fixer could reveal and how the defense is expected to undermine the star witness. Also terrifying moments for parishioners in western Pennsylvania. A tornado rips the steeple off a church with worshipers inside. The moment the lights went out and the troubling trend behind this unusual rash of storms. And Northern Exposure, a stellar show, lights up the skies across the U.S. this weekend. Why so many were able to enjoy the Aurora Borealis and when you could get another chance to see that spectacular solar system. Good morning. Good to have you with us on a Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off. We begin this morning with widespread panic gripping southern Gaza. Israel continues to prepare for its controversial ground offensive in the southern city of Rafah, with troops ordering more evacuations there. The United Nations estimates about 300,000 people have already fled that city, a place that has become a refuge for so many displaced civilians. The fighting in Rafah is intensifying despite several countries including the U.S., calling on Prime Minister Netanyahu to stop the operation. Some in Israel are also growing frustrated with the ongoing war. Thousands took to the streets Sunday night. Protesters called for an immediate return of the hostages being held by Hamas and for Netanyahu's resignation. The toll on Gaza is mounting. United Nations agencies in southern Gaza predict they will run out of food today. And the health ministry there says the death toll inside the enclave since the start of the war has now topped 35,000. Many of those killed are women and children. NBC News correspondent Hala Garani joins us now from Cairo, Egypt, with the latest on the war. Hala, good morning. So Israeli defense troops began ordering more evacuations from Rafah over the weekend to prepare for that ground offensive. At this point, are there any safe zones for Gazans to flee to? And how intense is the fighting on the ground right now? It's difficult to overstate just how catastrophic the humanitarian situation is right now in southern Gaza. Uh, almost 400,000 people, we understand, have fled parts of southern Gaza that the IDF told them to evacuate in anticipation of that long-promised offensive on Rafah that, as you mentioned in the introduction, the U.S. has publicly opposed for months now. And this is happening. Well, this humanitarian situation has reached worst-case scenarios in many parts of the South, where so many people have sought shelter. My colleague, Ayman Mahyaldin, spoke to an American trauma surgeon currently working in Gaza. Listen. I've seen combat and war wounds and um, have done surgery with humanitarian and disaster relief now for almost uh, 20 years. And this is nothing like this. Um, you know, the injuries, uh, the amount of children that I've seen is just, you know, unprecedented. I take care of more, you know, people under the age of 13 than I've ever taken care of before. Um, I've done more amputations and seen more traumatic amputations of children than I've seen during my entire career in the last two weeks. And this highlights the fact that uh, about two thirds of the population of Gaza consists of women and children. Back to you. Hala, we've talked so much about what's happening in southern Gaza, but northern Gaza remains mostly isolated because of the heavy bombing we saw at the beginning of this war. I know we're learning new information about new fighting, though, near Gaza City. What more do we know about that? Has Hamas regrouped in the north? Yeah, that's a great question because this is a phenomenon that we've observed now for the last few days. The Israeli military is, is battling 
Hamas fighters in areas of northern Gaza that it had previously cleared and where there, where there is near total destruction of residential life and infrastructure. In other words, the, there are, you know, this has become a, a full-on battleground. And there are concerns, therefore, that the IDF doesn't have a strategy for the areas that it has attacked in the first months of the war. In fact, uh, yesterday, Anthony Blinken was speaking on NBC on Meet the Press, uh, and he said um, that even if the IDF goes in to Rafah, there will still be thousands of armed Hamas left. That's something that he said that others have warned against for months now, uh, that when you have an insurgent force battling a regular army in the way that this uh, conflict has developed over the last more than half year now, that it is extremely difficult uh, to neutralize or to decapitate, as the Israeli leadership has said they intend to do with this particular force. And this is all happening as civilians are suffering immensely. All right, Hala Garani in Cairo. Hala, <clears throat> thank you so much. As she just mentioned, Secretary of State Antony Blinken made an appearance this weekend on Meet the Press. Speaking with moderator Kristen Welker, he addressed U.S. concerns over Israel's efforts to try and limit civilian casualties during a military operation in Rafah. Here's part of that conversation. I hear you saying you haven't seen a credible plan yet for how Israel would go into Rafah and mitigate civilian casualties. Is it fair to see, say that President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu are not seeing eye to eye right now? There are two things. One is that, as, as the president said, and as we said in many conversations over the last couple of months, there has to be a credible plan for the civilians. Have you seen a credible uh, we plan? Sure. We have not. Second, there's something else that's important. We also haven't seen a plan for what happens the day after this war in Gaza ends. Um, because right now, the trajectory that uh, Israel is on is even if it goes in and takes heavy action in, in Rafah, there will still be thousands of armed Hamas left. Um, we've seen in areas that Israel has cleared in the north, uh, even in Khan Yunus, Hamas coming back. So the trajectory right now is that going into uh, to Rafah, even to deal with these remaining battalions, um, especially in the absence of a plan for civilians, risks doing terrible harm to civilians and not solving the problem, a problem that both of us want to solve, which is making sure Hamas cannot again uh, govern Gaza. Uh, the, Israel's on the trajectory potentially to inherit an insurgency with many armed Hamas left, or if it leaves, a vacuum filled by chaos, filled by anarchy, and probably refilled by Hamas. We've been talking to them about a much better way of getting an enduring result enduring security, yeah. both in Gaza itself and much more broadly in the region. Uh, those conversations continue. And that's what partners, that's what allies do. We, uh, we uh, are clear-eyed yeah. and we speak the truth to each other as we see it. Um, we have American yeah. interests first and foremost in mind. We also have Israel's interests in mind. Yeah. And there may be a difference in view in, some, in the best way to achieve them. But that's also the nature of the relationship. You can see my full interviews and a lot more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press here on NBC News Now every weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Kristen, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist for more on how the Biden administration is responding to the latest in Gaza. Aaron, good morning. So we just saw it right there. The Biden administration remains critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu. How is Netanyahu responding and how much is this straining the relationship between these two leaders? Yeah, I think you heard Secretary Blinken there really characterize the complexity of the relationship between the two leaders, uh, particularly in the last several months as this conflict in Gaza has has uh, has continued. And, and and so what we've heard in the past from the two leaders uh, is that they have, have known each other for decades, obviously, but that their relationship has had moments of disagreement. And that really is as far as the two are going publicly. But we do know that there is some frustration on the part of the Biden administration and President Biden even with the way Israel has been handling this war in Gaza, the way the prime minister in particular has been handling this war in Gaza. Some frustration that some of the advice, some of the military tactics that the U.S. has suggested to the Israelis, uh, it's been heard, but it hasn't been activated in the way that the administration would like to see. And so there's this concern about whether and how uh, the Israelis will go into Rafah, into the southern part of Gaza uh, at this point. And that's, I think, some of, the, I think a lot of what we're hearing 
in terms of resistance from the administration, uh, a cautious tone from President Biden, is a result of concern about the million people who are now holed up in that part of Gaza, Joe? Just last week, Aaron, the Biden administration announced it'd be halting the shipment of certain weapons to Israel. Since then, the president has received vocal pushback from Congress. How is the Biden administration responding to that pushback? Is he still standing behind his decision? He is still standing behind his decision. And really, there's there's two parts to the decision that the president has made. Obviously, this word that came last week about the Biden administration withholding uh, about 3,500 large bombs. We're talking about those 2,000-pound bombs. Uh, there's been a pause placed on that shipment of new materials. At the same time, we know the administration has sent over uh, defensive weapons, small arms, for example, to the Israelis. And so it really speaks to, I think, Joe, the, the, the concern about the Israelis going into Rafah with a major, massive, large-scale military operation and what Secretary Blinken addressed there, the reality around the fact that in northern Gaza, it seems as though Hamas is, is growing again, is coming back into some level of power. And so they want the Israelis to have defensive weapons in particular so that, they continue, so that they can continue to fight Hamas, particularly in the areas where it seems as though that organization is, is coming back, Joe. We can't forget about the hostage situation. The families of five Americans who it's believed are still being held by Hamas met with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, also Middle East Coordinator Brett McGurk. What are we hearing from those families? Yeah, Joe, this was the, the eighth time that these families have met with uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. That meeting happened on Friday. Uh, it's something that's been a, a regular thing for Jake Sullivan, who obviously has been deeply involved in so much of what's been going on from the U.S. perspective, the negotiations that, been ha that have been happening, uh, decision-making around military activity. Uh, but it's been important for him, we understand, to meet with these families as well, to try to reassure them that the administration is continuing to make efforts to, to bring forth a ceasefire and to get these hostages released. Uh, we know from the families that they expressed some frustration that there seemed to be progress being made on a ceasefire deal and a hostage release, and then that fell apart last week. Uh, but the families remain hopeful, and they will continue to have these conversations with the administration. Joe? All right, Aaron Gilchrist. Aaron, thank you so much. Here in New York, the criminal hush money trial of former President Donald Trump is entering a pivotal week. What unfolds in that courtroom could dramatically shape the outcome of one of the most closely watched cases in American history. The prosecution is set to call its star witness to the stand later this morning, Mr. Trump's former fixer and lawyer, Michael Cohen. He's expected to testify about his role in facilitating the alleged hush money payment made to Stormy Daniels. It's an allegation the former president denies. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard's outside the courthouse for us in New York. We're also joined by our legal analyst, Angela Senadella. Von, let's start with you. So remind us why Michael Cohen is such an important witness for the prosecution. A reminder, he has served prison time for crimes related to all this, for lying and for campaign finance violations. So what is he expected to say on the stand over the next few days? Right, Joe, the rest of the witnesses built the story for Michael Cohen to fill in the gaps on here. Michael Cohen is that crucial witness that the prosecution has been waiting to call. And you asked, what is he going to share with this jury that the district attorney's office believes will lead to a guilty charge for Donald Trump? And it has everything to do with the fact that he was involved from start to finish. Not only that August of 2015 meeting at Trump Tower between David Pecker, the National Enquirer publisher, and Donald Donald Trump over the allegation that that is where the three of them concocted the catch and kill scheme to go purchase salacious stories, allegations that could be potentially politically damaging to Donald Trump before the 2016 election and ensure that those individuals were paid off and off the market. But then also the actual reimbursement checks. In 2017, Donald Trump in the White House, you'll recall Michael Cohen paying Stormy Daniels in October of 2016, that initial $130,000. $30,000, but then the witnesses, or I should say the prosecution, expects for Michael Cohen to testify that in 2017 he sought those reimbursement checks from Donald Trump while Donald Trump was in the White House. And that is where part of the alleged crime of the falsification of the business records comes into such crucial play here. Angela, Michael Cohen is not the perfect witness. As I mentioned, he comes with his own baggage. So, what does the prosecution need to do to get the best out of his testimony? 
Well, I think they've done quite a bit. As Vaughn mentioned, there was already a lot of corroboration, so many witnesses who really laid the context and the groundwork. They've also, though, in many ways, had these witnesses already discuss how potentially problematic his testimony could be, how he wasn't always the most trustworthy guy, because that's going to be the biggest issue on the stand. The fact that he has committed perjury before, he doesn't necessarily have a track record of saying things honestly on the stand, and he's also written multiple books and done so many media appearances with names, for example, like Revenge, which could potentially point to so much outside bias. So in the prosecution, not only are we going to see so many questions about whether or not Cohen was just the underling or whether or not he was really the fall guy for Donald J. Trump, but we will also see a lot of questions about when his credibility in the past was questioned. What was the reason for that and why this time is he telling the truth on the stand? They're going to lay that prior to the cross because at that point we know the defense is going to go so hard on that and just attack every time he's had any inconsistency. Angela, last week ahead of Cohen's testimony, the judge asked the prosecution to rein in Cohen over public comments he's making about Mr. Trump and the case, especially on TikTok. The defense is pointing at what they perceive as a double standard with Mr. Trump being under the strict gag order. Well, Cohen has been speaking out. Do you think the defense has the right to feel aggrieved here? And could Cohen's outbursts hurt the prosecution in any way? Well, I also want to note that the one of the violations, the alleged violations from the prosecution that the judge did not find of this gag order was when Trump was seemingly responding to Cohen. So it seems here the judge is aware of the defendant's right to respond. But we know there's a huge difference between witnesses and what they're allowed to do and also defendants. The defendant right now is the one on trial. Obviously, it's not Cohen. He's already served his time. So I think that we're going to see, you know, a lot of questions about these TikToks, about this, likely on cross, not necessarily to begin with. But we are going to see whether or not when he said these things, they represent outside bias because that's what we saw so much with Stormy Daniels also on the stand. When she has these other posts, do they reflect an outside motivation that's not honesty, Joe? Vaughn, the prosecution is signaling it could rest its case this week, saying they had two witnesses remaining. So real quick, what's next? Right, Joe, we don't know who that other witness is. So we've got Michael Cohen, another potential witness. The prosecution could rest its case by the end of this week. The defense will then have the opportunity to bring forward their own witnesses. There may be only one or two individuals. Of course, the outstanding variable is whether Donald Trump will testify himself. If he were to, that would take several days here. But we could very well, by the end of next week, if Donald Trump doesn't testify, we could potentially have this sent to the jury to determine the outcome of this trial. All right, Vaughn and Angela, thank you both. Just a few short blocks away from the Trump trial, another political figure faces a trial that begins today. This one includes bribery allegations involving gold bars, a brand new Mercedes, and a halal meat monopoly. This morning, jury selection begins in the federal corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. Now, he and his wife, Nadine, are accused of accepting bribes from three New Jersey businessmen in return for favors, including alleged meddling in criminal investigations and granting favors to the governments of Egypt and Qatar. FBI agents say they found stashes of gold bars in his home and nearly $500,000 stuffed into envelopes and hidden in clothes in his closet. Menendez and his wife Nadine deny any wrongdoing. They wrongdoing. They both pleaded not guilty to the charges. This is Menendez's second corruption trial. A previous bribery trial in 2017 ended in a hung jury. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now with a preview. Ken, good morning. So, I mean, this trial, you could say it has it all. Bribery, intrigue, halal food. Bring us up to speed on how we got here and what we can expect when court does get underway today. Hey, good morning, Joe. That's right. This is one of the most egregious set of corruption allegations against a public official in modern history, really. Senator Menendez is charged with conspiracy to commit bribery, fraud, extortion, obstruction of justice. And if that's not bad enough, he's charged with acting as an agent of a foreign government, of Egypt and of Qatar, of taking bribes, essentially selling his office to help not just his businessmen friends, but foreign governments. And that is really dramatic. And altogether, He's facing a maximum of more than 50 years in prison, although that's not likely the sentence here. Uh, he has, of course, pleaded not guilty. He's going to go on trial alongside 
two businessmen who are accused of paying him bribes. A third businessman charged in the case has pleaded guilty and has agreed to cooperate with prosecutors. His wife, who is also charged, is not standing trial today. So today, jury selection begins, and testimony, we believe, will unfold this week, and it's going to be fascinating, Joe. And have we been given any preview of his defense? The gold bars, for example, have raised so many eyebrows. Any explanations for that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, and it's really interesting, his defense team wants to call a psychiatrist who will testify about the reasons they say that he was hoarding cash and gold bars having to do with his uh, his family's tragic circumstances in Cuba, where their wealth was confiscated, and some uh, unfortunate things that happened with his father. Essentially, they want to argue that he had a propensity to keep cash at home. Prosecutors obviously not only disagree with that, they want to keep that testimony out altogether. And there's also some signs, Joe, you know, interestingly, that he may try to blame his wife, who was, according to this indictment, deeply involved in this corruption scheme. And he may try to say that it was really more her uh, soliciting some of these uh, bribes and, and, and arranging for the official actions and that he was ignorant of what was going on. Jeff. Let's let's talk more about this because this was originally supposed to be a joint trial. Then last month, a judge ordered separate trials for Menendez and his wife. This was after her attorneys requested a two month delay to deal with medical issues. So why are we seeing two trials here? Yeah, that's right, Joe. So uh, according to uh, the court, Nadine Menendez had surgery for an unspecified medical condition and is not fit to stand trial. So there will be a separate trial. She also had an issue where she had her lawyers had to leave the case because they've now become witnesses because they misrepresented certain facts as part of an alleged obstruction of justice scheme to prosecutors. So this is not an ideal situation for prosecutors. They don't want to try this case twice. They don't want Nadine Menendez to have a look at all the evidence. But this is where circumstances led them, and this is how it's going to go. All right. Ken Delaney and Ken, thank you so much. Later today in Baltimore, demolition crews will use explosives to clear a section of the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge that's lying atop the crash container ship. This comes after weeks of preparations. It's going to be the biggest step in the cleanup process since the bridge collapsed nearly seven weeks ago. The controlled demolition, now set for tonight, was put on hold yesterday because of lightning and rising tides. Officials say it's going to sound like fireworks, and they expect we're going to see multiple puffs of smoke. This process is important. It's going to allow the cargo ship Dolly to find its way to the port of Baltimore. It'll also open up maritime traffic through that area once again. It's soggy in the south to start your week with flooding concerns stretching from Texas all the way to Florida. So for more, let's get a look at your morning news now forecast with Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, Joe. So good to see you. And yeah, surprise, surprise, soggy in the south. We're looking at flooding rains as we go throughout this Monday and really the next couple of days. We're also looking at the threat for severe weather. And it's not just in the south. We have wet weather all the way to the Great Lakes as well. But this is the south right now looking at radar. You can see heavy rain falling. That's where we're seeing those darker colors, those reds, those oranges, the yellows. Even seeing a little purple popping in here, that could be some hail because we're seeing some lightning hearing that thunder as well. We have 11 million under flood watches from eastern Texas all the way along the Gulf Coast. And this will be the case as we go throughout today and then a little bit into tomorrow. That's going to shift a little bit further to the east. Now, on top of that, we're looking at the chance for some severe storms. So we do have an enhanced risk. That's three out of five on the scale, also a slight risk. So we're looking anywhere from Austin, Houston, Shreveport, Alexandria, all the way over to Mobile, Panama City. Could see some strong storms today. What does that mean? Well, we're looking at 23 million people impacted by the risk of severe storms. Could see very large hail once again, like we've seen with so many of these storms this season. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. That could bring down some trees, some power lines. The ground's going to be very, very wet and soggy. So we could see some power outages. A few tornadoes are possible as well, especially in eastern Texas along the Gulf Coast with this orange shading. And we could see that large hail, as I mentioned. The likeliest chance for that would be in this hatched area, the blue hatched area, where we could see in two inches in di diameter or even uh, bigger than that. So Austin, Houston, places like that. Then we're going to get rounds and rounds of rain. We could see two to three inches per hour. We could see up to eight inches in some spots. So we do have the risk for flooding. We have the risk for flash flooding as well, especially where you see this pink here. That's your moderate risk. So New Orleans, uh, Panama City could see some flooding conditions. Uh, rainfall forecast, it's a lot. We're looking at those dark colors here, reds, oranges, yellows. Again, locally up to five inches, but certainly could see up six, seven, even eight inches in some spots. This is why it's a big storm system.
That's moving off to the east. You can see the rain not only in the south, but spreading up to the Great Lakes as well. That severe risk from Texas to Mississippi. This moves off to the east tomorrow. We're looking at that system slowly drifting to the east. The strongest storms target the southeast. So now we're talking about uh, portions of the Carolinas into Florida once again. But we could see some rain moving into the mid-Atlantic, the northeast as well. And that's going to stay in place on Wednesday. As far as the severe threat goes on Tuesday, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Damaging hail not quite as big as today, but still an inch or larger. A brief tornado is possible, and that's mainly in the southeast into the Tennessee Valley, Birmingham, Atlanta, Abadalia, Albany, Albany, and Jacksonville. Again, we do have a flash flooding risk tomorrow because these, these storms have a lot of moisture to them. It's pulling the moisture off the Gulf, so we're going to see rounds of heavy rain from portions of the Ohio Valley into the Carolinas and also the southeast. So once again, soggy, and we are looking at the chance for some storms in the south. All right, we know you'll keep an eye on it. Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, graduation protests. Students walk out on Jerry Seinfeld's commencement address at Duke. We're going to bring you the latest as anti-war demonstrations come to commencements from coast to coast. But first, after the break, more weather. Tornadoes tearing through increasingly populated areas. So we're going to dig into the troubling trend for another weekend of violent weather. Stay with us. Welcome back. A church in western Pennsylvania was actually holding services when it was hit by a tornado over the weekend. That terrifying moment was caught on camera. We get the story from NBC News correspondent George Solis. Watch as this tornado rips through western Pennsylvania, shredding rooftops. The National Weather Service preliminarily says a twister was an EF2, with wind speeds of up to 118 miles per hour leaving some residents forced to seek shelter, including about 100 members of this local church, some infants. I go out and I see debris flying all over the auditorium, so I immediately tell everybody down in the basement. The tornado striking in the middle of church services. Watch as the lights go out as the pastor's wife was in the midst of a song. I thought I heard the windows start to shatter, and then the... Um, the sound was like a train coming through. That's the church steeple that flew off the building and damaged several cars. The pastor says, amazingly, no one was seriously hurt. The severe weather continuing a trend of tornadoes over the weekend, with four preliminary ones reported across the Ohio Valley and three potential ones in southwest PA. The National Weather Service reports there have been a staggering 746 preliminary tornadoes year to date, some that have recently decimated through the heartland. Back in Pennsylvania, cleanup is still underway. I heard the winds, like real strong winds at my house a half a mile away. Many also thankful they survived. There's no way we should be here. I'm telling you, the God was with us. George Solis, NBC News. That tornado in Pennsylvania is just one of hundreds that have touched down this spring. April and May are typically the most dangerous months for tornadoes. But so far this year, we're seeing more activity than usual. NBC News meteorologist Angie Lastman has more on what's driving this uptick. From Oklahoma. That's a tornado. To Iowa. Did you see it? To Tennessee. Violent tornado. Scenes of devastation across the country this week. Americans have always been fascinated by the power of tornadoes, from the blockbuster hit Twister in 1996, oh my God. to the upcoming Twister spinoff that looks like it could be the movie of the summer. But the tornadoes we've seen day after day have been all too real. That's a tornado, large tornado, right here, in view. Six weeks of punishing storms have left a trail of destruction thousands of miles long. Everywhere around me, it's a war zone. It's all gone. People across the country wondering, are tornadoes more common and are they getting stronger? When you look at the number of days where 30 or more tornadoes occurred on a given day, which would be outbreak days, those have increased. Steven Strader is an associate professor at Villanova and studies climate and natural disasters. And those tornado outbreaks he's talking about are responsible for 80% of all twister deaths. One of the reasons? More tornadoes are touching down further east, outside the Great Plains, hitting towns and cities not used to seeing them this often. There's many more people in those rural areas in the southeast where vulnerability is heightened. A lot more nocturnal tornadoes worse tree cover, more tree cover, all of these influence the vulnerability and exposure. Is climate change to blame? The answer, it's complicated. 
Scientists are hesitant to make a direct link between climate change and tornado activity. For one, tornadoes are too small and brief to accurately model. But one thing is clear. A warming climate provides the fuel for supercell storms, the massive systems that can spin off these twisters. In the future, we expect to see more of those events. That fuel that feeds the thunderstorms is fueled by heat and moisture at the surface. And those are expected to increase as we go through the next 30, 40 years. Experts say that as storm patterns continue to shift, humans need to adjust as well. As cities grow and expand, there's more targets to hit when a tornado occurs. Think of Wizard of Oz with the tornado dancing behind Dorothy as she's running to the shelter. It's not going through a field anymore. It's going through a brand new subdivision. So we have to be aware that how we build is just as important as how strong the tornado is. And our thanks to Angie Lastman for that report. Let's get to some international news, starting over in Russia, where President Vladimir Putin is shaking up his military leadership. NBC News international correspondent Claudio Labanga has that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. Vladimir Putin has decided to replace his close ally, Sergei Shoigu, with a civilian economist. His name is Andrei Belosov as his new defense minister. Now, this surprising reshuffle is a strategic move. Russia is looking to make better use of their defense spending to garner a win in the war against Ukraine, which has been going on now for more than two years. Shoigu, the now former defense minister, will serve as secretary of Russia's Security Council. Now let's travel over to India, where the fourth phase of voting in the general elections is happening today. The country is working to select 96 people to the lower house of parliament. Nearly 1 billion people are registered to vote in more than 500 parliamentary constituencies in the country. This is the world's largest electoral exercise. Results will come out next month. And finally, Nemo Mettler is the winner of this year's Eurovision Song Contest. The non-binary singer is Switzerland's first Eurovision winner since Celine Dion. Yes, I know, Joe, now you might be thinking, Claudio Celine Dion is not from Switzerland, she's Canadian. Yes, that's correct, I know, but she still represented the country and swept the competition back in 1998. Nemo, this year's winner, captured the hearts by rapping and singing about their journey to discovering their identity. Joel? Very cool. Congratulations. And I did not know that about Celine Dion. So thank you for that fun fact, Claudio. All right, coming up, an NBC News broadcast exclusive. Why one gay couple living right here in New York says the city is discriminating against them. The landmark IVF lawsuit that they hope is going to spur nationwide change. That's next. Welcome back. As the wave of protests over the Israel-Hamas war continue on college campuses, students at Duke University walked out during their commencement over the weekend. They were protesting a speech given by legendary comedian Jerry Seinfeld. NBC News correspondent Elwin Lopez shows us what happened. Comedian Jerry Seinfeld taking the stage at Duke University, where he was scheduled to deliver the commencement address and receive an honorary degree. Soon after he was introduced, students walked out, some waving Palestinian flags, losing chants erupted. It comes after weeks of protests at colleges nationwide against the Israel-Hamas war. Seinfeld later delivering his speech. Again, a lot of you are thinking, I can't believe they invited this guy. Too late. I say, use your privilege. I grew up a Jewish boy from New York. That is a privilege if you want to be a comedian. The sitcom creator taking to Instagram after the Hamas attack on Israel October 7th, stating in part, I will always stand with Israel and the Jewish people, later visiting Tel Aviv. The university saying in part, we respect the right of everyone at Duke to express their views peacefully. It's the latest in a series of weekend interruptions at graduations across the country. At UC Berkeley, the student body president's speech was interrupted by chance. This wouldn't be Berkeley without a protest, so I get it. In Wisconsin, a handful of students turned their backs on the chancellor, some wearing graduation caps with messages like Free Palestine. And at the University of Texas, dozens protested on campus after the ceremony concluded. The tension on campuses nationwide coming to a boiling point, just as universities and colleges break for the summer. Elwin Lopez, NBC News. 
The city of New York is facing a first-of-its-kind class action lawsuit. A city employee is claiming he couldn't get insurance to cover fertility treatment because of his sexual orientation. He's married to another man. Now, he and his partner are suing the city, claiming that its IVF practices are discriminatory because they're offered to female employees and male employees with female partners. NBC News Now anchor Zinclay Esamwa spoke with the couple about their push for changes nationwide. We met in 2011 in law school. So you've been married for eight years. Did you know you would want to grow your family? Yeah, that was almost a prerequisite to, you know, getting into a relationship. But to meet that prerequisite as a gay couple seeking biological children, Nicholas Majapinto and Corey Briskin needed in vitro fertilization. They expected IVF to be covered by Briskin's insurance, but it wasn't. I remember also thinking, at that time, wow, it's 2021 in New York City and we're facing this issue. That's wild. And now we're in 2024, three years later, and the policy remains on the books. Now they're filing a class action lawsuit against New York City officials and offices, alleging the city has categorically excluded gay male employees and their partners from receiving IVF benefits. As gay men, as a, or a single man where there is no uterus in the relationship, there is no path towards coverage. Historically, infertility has been defined as a disease or condition caused by a failure to get pregnant within a year of unprotected sex involving a female partner. As of March 2024, only seven states, including New York, require insurers to cover IVF for same-sex couples who cannot conceive on their own. The couple, who live in Brooklyn, initially filed a legal complaint with New York City's Equal Employment Opportunity Commission back in 2022, but NBC reporting found the city said it does not provide IVF benefits to surrogates and, as a result, could not provide the requested benefits to Majapinto and Briskin. The couple says they only wanted coverage for IVF. Today, at least four other states are now weighing updated IVF coverage mandates. Everybody uh, in this state who wants to have a child should be able to do so. It comes as the traditional definition for infertility is shifting to recognizing all persons, regardless of marital status, sexual orientation, or gender identity. But not all states recognize this definition. Title VII protects uh, people in their employment realms from discrimination. Attorney Victoria Ferreira specializes in fertility cases. The argument on the other side, having a baby is elective. Do we then have to mandate coverage for all elective procedures? It sounds like a philosophical question of whether or not people have an innate right to have a child. I, I think you're right. Is there a right to have a child? And it's also impacting private insurance. Earlier this month, healthcare giant Aetna settled a years-long class action suit and will now offer equal fertility coverage to same-sex couples. Couples like Emma Goidel and Alana Kaplan, who say they spent more than $50,000 on fertility treatment after Aetna rejected them. It's really gratifying to know that so many people, so many of those people are going to be positively impacted by Aetna's decision here. Aetna tells NBC News in part, we are committed to providing quality care and pleased to reach a resolution to this matter. As for this New York couple's ongoing suit, in response, the mayor's office tells NBC News the case, quote, will be a long process. For the 300,000 plus city employees, who is standing up for them to make sure that this wrong is set right. These husbands hoping their case can spark change for others. Our thanks to Zinclay Esamwa for that report. We want to add NBC News did reach out to the 10 largest healthcare companies for comment on their fertility coverage offerings. We did not immediately hear back. Coming up, streaming synergy popular services, HBO Max, Disney Plus and Hulu are going to be bundled together. But how much could it cost and is that worth it? What you need to know just ahead. This is Morning News Now. We're back with some money news on this Monday morning. Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery recently announced they're teaming up to launch a cable TV style streaming bundle. It'll combine some popular streaming services, Disney Plus, Hulu and Max. 
And this comes just two months after Disney said it's going to crack down on password sharing. The bundle is going to be available later this year. Let's bring in CNBC analyst and commentator Ron Insana for more on this. Ron, good to have you with us. So first of all, why are Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery teaming up, combining their products here? What does this tell us right now about the business model for streaming? Well, I think they're doing everything that I thought they would do when streaming started, which is they're going to recreate cable with a new way of delivering the same content and maybe more of it. But what they're really trying to do is cut down on churn. You know, a lot of uh, consumers will, will uh, sign on to a streaming service, watch what they want, cancel it, sign up again. And so when you combine all these services together, it reduces the likelihood that consumers will just cut off their subscriptions to a big bundle of, of services like Max, like Hulu Plus, like Dis or Hulu and Disney Plus. And what also probably become ultimately more economical for the consumer and it might also save uh, the uh, big entertainment companies some money as well. Yeah, we see some of the prices laid out there. I think folks are starting to realize how much all this is adding up. I know we don't yet know the price tag for this bundle. Any clue, Ron, how much it could cost? And just like bigger picture here, with so many streaming services out there, their costs constantly rising. Just what's the best advice for consumers right now? Especially maybe, like, I still have cable, too. It feels like I'm just paying way too much money right now. I think, I, I think I'm using, I don't want to make, make it an ad, but I'm using YouTube TV because they bought the football package. My team's out of out of uh, network, you know. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to see a lot more bundling. I think you're going to have, as I said before, a recreation in certain respect of the cable model, where you're going to go to one place and have access to a variety of different bundling services. It'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, this combination adds sports and like ESPN or ESPN Plus to the mix, and whether or not we consistently see now all these different streaming services services bundled together the same way we did with cable back in the early days. It took a long time, but eventually you had cable distributors provide a wide variety of channels, you know, through a single service. And ultimately, I think they also need to be a little more conscious of how much this is costing consumers. And I, I expect that the bundled package will be cheaper than buying them individually today. You mentioned the sports thing. I mean, this is obviously a huge issue, especially with so many sports out there. We know Warner Brothers, Discovery, Disney, they're, they're joining forces with Fox now to offer the sports-focused streaming service. What are we learning about that? What do you see as sort of the future when it comes to sports and streaming and trying to sort all this out? Again, we, we think, I think anyway, and I, having been in the cable business now for 40 business, I, 40 years, I should say, they're probably going to add those services ultimately. I mean, there might be a situation in which some of the sports uh, networks are uh, distributed on a standalone basis. That does seem to be the plan from Disney. Uh, those are generally more expensive because the rights to acquire sports are so expensive. In fact, the NBA is up in the air. Our parent, Comcast, is, is said to be expecting to bid on the so-called B package of NBA games trying to take that away from Warner Brothers. So that competition is going to remain intense. And whether or not they cooperate on that side of the business is an open question. But I think ultimately that's what's going to happen because, again, convenience and cost are going to be two very, very big issues for consumers and for the companies if they want to limit customer churn and maintain uh, those streaming revenues over time. Ron and Sana, good to have you with us this morning. Thanks for joining us. Certainly. To get some more money news now, Apple employees in Maryland might soon be heading to the picket line. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that and other news that affects your wallet. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. You know, Apple stores are really important. That's where people try out their, their gear and they really help boost sales. Well, workers at Apple's Towson, Maryland store have now voted to authorize a strike, according to a statement released by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. The union, which represents Apple's retail store workers in Maryland, said their concerns include work-life balance, unpredictable scheduling practices, and wages that don't align with the cost of living. A work stoppage date has not been scheduled yet. Meantime, Apple retail employees in New Jersey voted this weekend against unionization. The union blamed the defeat on the company's behavior and filed a complaint this week accusing the tech giant of retaliating against a leader of the state's organizing effort. Apple has denied wrongdoing and has declined to comment on the result of that vote. Meantime, a lot of folks went to the movies this weekend and they were watching Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. It scored big at the box office, bringing in more than $56 million and 
top, that topped industry estimates. Movie's opening is the second highest in the franchise, surpassing 2017's War for the Planet of the Apes. This is Disney's first movie in theaters this year. The company's co-chair Alan Bergman said it's among the films that he expects to reinvigorate the studio in 2024. And investors are certainly watching that carefully. It, Joe? It is interesting to see what movies are succeeding, which ones are struggling a little more. I think the studios are trying to figure all this out. All right, Bertha, thank you so yeah, much. I think it just has to do with not boring people. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> the same things over and over and over again. See, that's right? a strategy. Don't bore people. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. Good to see you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, Solar Spectacular. Over the weekend, the Northern Lights put on a show for millions of people who normally never get to see them. But if you missed out, don't worry. You could soon get another chance. That story next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. I wanted to take a moment to thank my alma mater, Northwestern University, specifically the Medill School of Journalism. You may have noticed I was gone last week it's because I returned to my college campus in Evanston, Illinois, where I was inducted into Medill's Hall of Achievement. It was truly one of the biggest honors of my career. In all, seven alums were inducted, including author Jonathan Eig, who also learned last week he won the Pulitzer Prize, and Admiral Lisa Franchetti, who's the Chief of Naval Operations some really impressive and humbling company. My parents, my sister, my partner were also there to help celebrate truly a week I'll never forget. Thank you again to Medill. Let's end this hour with a spectacular light show that we don't usually see here in the U.S. The Aurora Borealis, also known as the Northern Lights, lit up the skies above North America over the weekend. The phenomenon was caused by a massive geomagnetic storm on the sun. Now, if you missed it, don't worry. We could have another chance to see the Northern Lights this week. For more on this, we're joined by former NASA astronaut, friend of the show, Mike Massimino. He's also a senior advisor for space programs at the Intrepid Museum right here in New York. Mike, good to have you with us. So let's start with the basics here. What are auroras and why don't we usually see them here in most of the U.S.? Uh, hi, Joe. Congratulations on your award. That's pretty cool to see that. Uh, it, so what it is, uh, the sun is, is constantly having these explosions, eruptions, and the activity sometimes gets intense. And in those periods, the, the uh, charged particles that are ejected out of the sun in these big explosions reach the Earth and interact with our atmosphere. And since we, we have a magnetic field, we are protected really well from a lot of the, um, the, the, the activity from that harmful, potential harmful activity. We're protected by our magnetic field. But because we have a magnetic field, when those charged particles hit the atmosphere, they get drawn to the poles which is the North Pole and the South Pole. And because those poles are drawn in those areas, that's why you normally see the interaction of those particles with our atmosphere in the North or Southern uh, areas of our, of our planet. And what the colors are is those charged particles interacting with the gases that are the elements that are in our atmosphere, like oxygen and nitrogen. So when those particles interact with oxygen and nitrogen, they cause these colors. So that's why you see the colors and that's why you see those colors typically in the north or in the southern extremes of our planet. So I understand this was the strongest solar storm to reach Earth's atmosphere since 2003. How big of a deal is that? And, and like, should we be concerned about that at all? I, I wouldn't necessarily be concerned here. This is uh, typically things that'll that'll come in a cycle. And as you said, you know, that we've had a this is the biggest one we've had in in 20 years or so. And they, they come like they come in those types of patterns. So as you said, we, we had it the last couple of days. We may get a little bit more the next couple of days, and then it'll probably come around again, maybe in a couple months at a higher intensity, and then it'll go quiet for a while. And then at some other point, we'll, we'll see some more activity. So the, it's very cyclical. It's been going on for a long time, pretty <laughs> much since the beginning of the solar system. So it's, I don't think it's anything necessarily to be worried about. We, we have gotten pretty good at protecting our equipment, which is vulnerable. Uh, both in space, the astronauts in space have to worry about this. They're a little more vulnerable because they're a little further off the planet, but also all the uh, electrical grids and equipment we have here on the planet, we try to protect as, as best we can from, uh, from interruptions. 
even though we didn't have iPhones all those many, many years ago, we know that it still happened. Uh, so yeah. we have like a minute left here, Mike, but you mentioned, do we know exactly when we could see them again in the future? And, and what are the best times to look for the Northern Lights? They're, they're hard to predict exactly. They, it's kind of, this is a whole field of, uh, of astronomy and science called space weather. Just studying the sun and its, and its eruptions and when the solar activity is gonna get intense. So we can know when to protect ourselves, both our astronauts in space and equipment we have here on the ground. But I don't know if they're ever going to get really good at uh, predicting these things. Like we can't, you know, like even weather on the Earth, we've gotten pretty good at. I don't know if we'll ever get that good at it because it's very unpredictable. But they do come in kind of bunches where there is kind of like a solar storm season that will last for a few months at least. And I think we we'll, might see more of these coming up throughout the uh, throughout the year. I don't know if it'll be as intense as we have. But I think you can expect more uh, throughout the year. I don't know if they'll come back down as low as they were now, uh, down to where you could see them in the in the United States. But hopefully we can, because it's a reminder of, of we're part of the universe, just like the eclipse was yeah. last month. This is a pretty cool reminder that we, we are out there and part of this whole universe right. uh, that, that sometimes we forget about. Yeah, and the good news is if you want to know, just look outside your window and look up, and boom, you'll have your answer. All right, Mike Massimino, yeah. always good to have you with us. Thank you so much. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Good Monday morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off right now on Morning News Now, a make or break moment in Donald Trump's hush money trial. Michael Cohen, Trump's former right hand man, preparing to testify today in a face to face courtroom standoff with his former boss. The star witness's testimony marks a pivotal moment in the trial. Once paid to fix Trump's problems, Cohen could blow this case wide open, revealing secrets prosecutors say he was paid to cover up. Trump's going to be in court for it all after spending the weekend on the campaign trail. We have team coverage. Also this morning, battles raging on across Gaza. Israeli forces, defense forces prepare for a full-scale ground assault on the southern city of Rafa. Tens of thousands of people there forced to flee after Israel renewed an urgent warning to civilians to evacuate. Comes as heavy fighting breaks out in the north as well. We're going to have the latest. Plus, keep calm and travel on. Summer travel season set to kick off with what is expected to be a record-breaking Memorial Day weekend. We're going to have your travel outlook and tell you how you can avoid some potential headaches. And elevating the game, we are talking to WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert about the rising interest in women's basketball, the new generation of players like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese joining the league, how she plans to keep that sports winning streak alive. Good to have you with us. We begin this hour with the criminal hush money trial of former President Donald Trump. Today, he is set to come face to face with his former lawyer, Michael Cohen. Now, Cohen is the prosecution's star witness in what could be a make or break week for the case. Mr. Trump's former fixer turned foe is expected to testify on his role in arranging the hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to conceal an alleged sexual encounter with the former president. Mr. Trump denies that story. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Hey, good morning. For years, Michael Cohen had been Mr. Trump's attack dog in front of the camera and, of course, behind the scenes. But that all fell apart once Cohen came under federal investigation. This jury has already read his text messages, heard his voice on tape, but now they're going to be the ultimate judge of his credibility on the stand. He once said he would take a bullet for the former president. But this morning, Michael Cohen takes the stand as a key witness for the state in Donald Trump's criminal trial. The dramatic face-off between Mr. Trump and his former fixer, a pivotal moment as prosecutors wind down their case. The jury has seen evidence it was Cohen who bought the silence of Stormy Daniels just days before the 2016 election, as Cohen admitted years later in a stunning moment before Congress. Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds to avoid any money being traced back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. And jurors have seen the invoices and checks documenting how Mr. Trump paid Cohen back, calling his repayments legal expenses, a disguise, according to prosecutors and Cohen's lawyers, to cover up the hush money scheme, which Mr. Trump denies. 
I know that the corroboration and the detail backing up Michael is what people don't recognize. If it wasn't legal fees, Mr. Trump knew there were no legal services. But so Cohen's I baggage is well documented. His prior convictions for campaign finance violations and lying to Congress, likely just one part of what will undoubtedly be a grueling cross-examination. As the defense team argues, he's a scorned man who makes a living off tearing down his old boss. Even the judge directing prosecutors Friday to warn Cohen to stop talking about Mr. Trump from now on. The presumptive GOP nominee moving from the trial to the trail over the weekend. I've come here from New York. Drawing huge crowds in neighboring New Jersey, which overwhelmingly went for Biden in 2020. I've been indicted more than the great Alphonse Capone, and I got indicted more than him on bullshit. Mr. Trump also pivoting to his favorite campaign topics, including immigration, invoking another famous criminal. Silence of the Lamb. Has anyone ever seen the Silence of the Lamb? The late, great Hannibal Lecter is a wonderful man. He oftentimes would have a friend for dinner. The former president went on to levy his usual attacks against the district attorney's office, but made no mention of Michael Cohen. Interestingly, of course, Mr. Trump is still under a gag order that bars him from attacking witnesses and has already paid 10 grand for his violations so far. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Let's dig deeper with NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good to have you with us. All right, so with Michael Cohen taking the stand, what's the prosecution strategy here? What do they need to do to make sure the pros outweigh the cons? Michael Cohen is basically here. Everything's been window dressing leading to this moment, and he will almost certainly testify that Donald Trump told him, number one, to pay off Stormy Daniels. Number two, that Donald Trump intended for Michael Cohen to do that and intended to repay Michael Cohen uh, for his transaction, paying money to Stormy Daniels. And all of that was known to Donald Trump, understood by him, and that Michael Cohen was acting at his direction. And that's it. That is the goal of having Michael Cohen testify. The challenge for the prosecution is that he lacks credibility, which is why they spent so much time building up Michael Cohen's testimony before he even takes the stand with evidence and witnesses that tend to corroborate what Michael Cohen will say. Because when it gets to cross-examination, and cross might last longer than direct examination, it's going to be pretty tough for Michael Cohen. Yeah, what does the defense need to do during cross, and why do you expect that could last longer? They need to discredit Michael Cohen. They need to make it sound as if Michael Cohen went rogue on his own, which he will deny. I mean, that's the challenge when you get up and cross-examine a witness like this who's going to be so hostile uh, that when they ask that question, if they phrase it as, you're just making it up that Donald Trump told you to pay off Stormy Daniels, he's going to say, no, that's just not the way it went down. And so the best the defense can do is attack his credibility because he really is the only or primary witness who's going to say, Donald Trump told me to do these bad things. Let's talk about the gag order. Clearly no gag order when it comes to talking about Hannibal Lecter. But right now, Trump not allowed to talk about Cohen. However, Cohen has been talking a lot about Trump. That includes on TikTok. The judge doesn't seem to like this, is asking the prosecution to try and keep that from happening. Is this something that could hurt the prosecution? How big of a deal is this? I was in court on Friday when this issue came up at the end of the day, and arguably it was more interesting than all of the day's testimony, which was relatively for different, day, you know, compared to other days, relatively dry on Friday. You didn't have any star witnesses. So uh, the judge here sort of uh, split the difference when the, prosec when the defense said, hey, extend your gag order to Michael Cohen, make him stop talking. Instead of actually issuing an order, the judge said to the prosecution, Tell him that uh, this comes from the bench. Do not talk anymore. But it wasn't really an order, so really it's probably more guidance. And Michael Cohen, if he's feeling lucky, could probably just say, well, hey, it's not an order. I'll keep tweeting or keep talking about Donald Trump. But, I mean, we're at the end of the trial, so silencing Michael Cohen now would be sort of like uh, closing the barn door after the horse has escaped. We do think the prosecution is going to wrap up possibly by the end of this week. When it's the defense's turn, do we expect a big case? Do we expect maybe just one or two witnesses? What's going to happen? This is so hard for me to predict because as a defense attorney, I tend to shy away from putting on a lot of evidence because it is such a risk to put on evidence in the defense case. You may be ahead and snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. You don't want to open a door by putting a witness on that might 
damage your case because the defense never has the burden. You can always just rest on the idea that the prosecution has not met their burden. So why give them more grist for the mill by calling witnesses? So I don't expect we'll see a very long defense case, uh, but I imagine they'll put on a couple witnesses. I just don't know who exactly they're going to put on. The odds Trump testifies are... They're very low. I've been saying just to be the underdog that he might testify. He has an absolute constitutional right to testify. Do not listen to him making statements that he wants to testify. Uh, the list of unfulfilled promises by Donald Trump is a mile long. He knows no one will remember that he made that promise. Ultimately, I think the odds are that he won't. But he has an absolute constitutional right to do so. And the defense may ultimately take the view as, hey, why not? Let's try something. All right. Danny, thank you so much as always. This weekend marked a major milestone for college seniors all across the country, graduation. But a number of those ceremonies were affected by the ongoing pro-Palestinian protests. Students at Duke University walked out as commencement speaker Jerry Seinfeld took the stage. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk takes a closer look. It's going to be a week of graduation ceremonies, including here at NYU. The business school kicks off its events today. We are likely to see more protests like the ones we saw over the weekend. Dozens of students walked out of Duke University's commencement address. Jerry Seinfeld giving the speech. Those students held their ceremonies outside the school stadium, one of many places where students used their own graduations to protest over the war in Gaza. Tensions reaching a breaking point at college campuses nationwide. With graduation ceremonies becoming the latest flashpoint for ongoing anti-war protests. Over the weekend, dozens of Duke University students staging a walkout as comedian Jerry Seinfeld began his commencement speech. I grew up a Jewish boy from New York. That is a privilege if you want to be a comedian. After Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, Seinfeld posted on Instagram, I will always stand with Israel and the Jewish people, and visited the country back in December to show his support. Duke University releasing a statement writing in part, We respect the right of everyone at Duke to express their views peacefully without preventing graduates and their families from celebrating their achievement. This walkout just one of many nationwide impacting end-of-year campus events. Pro-Palestinian demonstrators blocked entryways ahead of a commencement ceremony for Pomona College. The school had moved the event after protesters set up an encampment on the stage. At UC Berkeley, home of the free speech movement, dozens of students interrupted graduation waving pro-Palestinian flags and banners. This wouldn't be Berkeley without a protest, so I get it. The demonstration later moving behind the main stage where hundreds of others joined in. Dozens of VCU graduates silently walked out during Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin's speech. This comes after police in riot gear arrested 25 protesters at the University of Virginia last week. According to an NBC News tally, nearly 3,000 arrests have been made on campuses nationwide in weeks of protests. U.S. News and World Report is out with a new survey today that says that 67 percent of students at top schools feel that anti-Semitism is a problem on campus. 38 percent say they feel unsafe. Meanwhile, at Duke University, Jerry Seinfeld's son attends the school. His daughter graduated from there. We reached out for his team for comment and did not hear back. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. New developments now out of Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of people are evacuating the city of Rafa ahead of a planned ground invasion by Israeli troops. The U.S. is now ramping up its efforts to try and stop that invasion, saying Israel has no real exit strategy from the region. This comes as the fighting picks up in northern Gaza, putting officials on alert for a possible resurgence of Hamas near Gaza City. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is in Jerusalem with the latest. From the start of this war seven months ago, Israel has mostly been fighting from the north to the south, clearing areas like Gaza City and then moving on to other areas further south, ultimately ending up in Rafah. And the geography is important because now fighting has once again resumed in the north, in and around Gaza City, suggesting that Israeli troops find themselves like American troops found themselves years ago in Iraq. Back then, they described it as whack-a-mole, where they would clear one area only to see the enemy 
pop up somewhere else. Israel is fighting Hamas once again this morning in northern Gaza, where the militants have regrouped. Secretary Blinken this weekend offering increasingly public American criticism, suggesting Israel has no exit strategy from Gaza. Israel's on the trajectory potentially to inherit an insurgency with many armed Hamas left, or if it leaves, a vacuum filled by chaos, filled by anarchy, and probably refilled by Hamas. Israel's main focus is still on Rafah in southern Gaza. Israel is ordering civilians to leave the city, packed with 1.4 million people, most of them displaced from other parts of Gaza. Israeli troops have not moved into the center of Rafah, but appear to be laying the groundwork for a major assault, bombing heavily and destroying infrastructure. Amal Harazadeen tells us she can't move again with her five children. They walk to Rafah from the north and live in this tent. My kids will die. They will be victims, she says. In Israel, many families of the 132 hostages still in Gaza are increasingly despondent, too. On Mother's Day, I spoke to Rachel Goldberg Pollan. Her son, Hirsch, an American, was kidnapped and lost his hand during Hamas's October 7th massacre. A Hamas video this month showed he's still alive or at least was recently. Hostage negotiations have stalled. Are you, are you on this emotional roller coaster every day? I am commanding myself every day to stay hopeful. So I don't go plummeting and I don't go super high falsely. So the same way you don't count your chickens before they hatch, we don't count our hostages until we're hugging them. Today is Memorial Day in Israel, honoring this country's fallen soldiers. And today, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said that once again, Israel faces a war for its existence, that it's either Israel's survival or Hamas. All right, Richard, thank you for that report. This morning, jury selection begins in the federal corruption trial against New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. He and his wife are accused of accepting bribes from three wealthy businessmen in return for government favors. And court documents allege those bribes were pretty lavish. Gold bars, payments toward a home mortgage, compensation for a job prosecutors say they likely never showed up to, Mercedes, jewelry, even exercise equipment. Menendez and his wife Nadine both deny any wrongdoing. She will be tried separately later this year. Now, this is Menendez's second time facing corruption charges. Back in 2015, he was accused of accepting bribes from a Florida eye doctor. That case ended in a mistrial with a hung jury. Senator Menendez says that he will not run for re-election as a Democrat, but is still considering an independent run. A week ahead, let's get a check now on your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman is here. Michelle, good morning. Good morning, Joe. And it's going to be more of the same. At least today, we're starting out with a threat for severe storms. We're starting out with a threat for flooding rains as well. And the rain is falling right now in the south. So we have rain all the way from the Gulf Coast states into the Great Lakes. It's a big storm system that's going to bring these impacts. But it's down to the south where we're pulling off that Gulf moisture. So lots of warm air. We're going to bring the chance for some strong storms. Back to the west, it's really warm. Uh, above average temperatures in the northwest. Plenty of sunshine throughout the southwest. And it looks like the northeast parts of the mid-Atlantic, it's going to end up to be a really nice afternoon. We start out with a little fog, a little bit of cloud cover, but we're going to see some sunshine and warm temperatures by this afternoon before the rain fills back in later on tonight into tomorrow. So then it leads us to Wednesday. There are those eastern showers from New England all the way down to the Carolinas, parts of the southeast. You can see some yellow here that's indicating that we could see some heavier rainfall throughout parts of the northeast, the middle of the country, looking at more rain from the northern plains, parts of the upper Midwest into the central and southern plains and staying warm and dry out west. That's good news. Southwest, we're looking at really warm temperatures as well. Then talking about Friday, feeling nice in the middle of the country, rocky snow, so some spring snow in the upper, the highest elevations of the Rockies, and then strong storms once again along the Gulf Coast states into parts of the southeast. That's going to bring more heavy rain, so once again, probably looking at the chance of more flooding later on this week, but look how that rain extends into the Great Lakes and northeast all the way to parts of New England, so it's going to be a wet week for many of us. This is why we have a big storm system that's moving off to the east, widespread rain from the Gulf uh, Coast states to the Great Lakes, 
severe risk from Texas to eastern uh, eastern Texas and Mississippi. By tomorrow, we'll look at that system slowly moving off to the east. This is a slow mover. Lots of rain with it, so the strongest storms targeting the southeast region tomorrow. I'll show you that in just a minute. Then by uh, Wednesday, we're going to see that move off into the northeast. Today, 11 million people impacted by flood alerts. You can see that heavy rain falling now. It's been falling for hours. It's going to be falling over this really wet terrain. So we're looking at the chance for some power outages as trees come down because we're going to see winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. And Joe, we could see some tornadoes as well. Large hail up to four inches in some spots. This is something, something we're going to watch throughout the evening and nighttime hours. That is some big hail. All right, yeah. Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. Much more to come on this hour of morning news now. Up next, Royal Snub. King Charles giving Prince William a military honor that has a special significance to Prince Harry. Hmm. We're going to tell you how it can be adding to tensions within the royal family. And later, McDonald's could be looking to supersize your savings mid rising prices at the drive through. What we're learning about a new $5 meal deal. We'll be right back. We're back now with new signs of a royal rift coming from Buckingham Palace. This morning, King Charles is giving Prince William a prestigious military title that has special significance to his brother, Prince Harry. This comes as Harry and Meghan wrap up a very royal looking tour of Nigeria. NBC News International correspondent Kelly Cobier is outside Buckingham Palace covering it all for us. Kelly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. Yes, that ceremony is happening today in a place outside of London. The king uh, handing over this military title to Prince William, a title with a special connection uh, to Prince Harry, who flew helicopters while stationed in Afghanistan. Um this morning, King Charles is officially bestowing another title on his oldest son, making Prince William Colonel-in-Chief of the Army Air Corps, a title that would hold a special significance to his brother, Prince Harry. William, now the ceremonial leader of the unit Harry served with in Afghanistan. I think if Harry had still been a working member of the royal family, this is an honor, a military honor, that would certainly have gone to him. He would have been the most appropriate recipient. The palace announced the move last week when Harry was in London, where he did not meet his father or brother. The Sunday Times reporting unnamed friends of the king dispute that Charles refused to find time to meet Harry. Harry and his wife Meghan on their own royal style tour in Nigeria over the weekend, playing seated volleyball, attending fundraisers, standing for the British national anthem, God Save the King, during a reception for military families. But no protocol to follow. This visit, part of the couple's own mission, not one on behalf of the king. Megan said she learned of her Nigerian heritage through a DNA test. And thank you very much for just how gracious you've all been in welcoming my husband and I to this country, my country. <laughs> the couple also opening up about their son and daughter, Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet telling school children Archie loves construction and Lily likes to sing and dance. Princess Lilibet turns three in June. She and her brother Archie did actually meet the king a couple of years ago when the family was here for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The question still, which we don't have an answer to, Joe, is whether they'll be back and reunited with their grandfather, the king, in June for the Trooping of the Color, the, the official birthday parade. All right, we'll have to see. A lot to cover this morning. Kelly Cobiea, thank you so much. More international news now. Devastating flash floods have killed hundreds in Afghanistan. NBC News international correspondent Claudio Lavanga has that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. That's right. The United Nations says that about 300 people have died so far in Afghanistan in some of the worst flash floods in recent memory there. Now, the UN's health agency said that since Friday, unprecedented rainfall damaged and destroyed thousands of homes in the Baglan province in the north of the country, also warning that hundreds of people may still be trapped beneath debris and mud. Let's go to Australia now, where two passengers and a pilot managed to walk out of a small plane uninjured after it was forced to land without landing gear due to a mechanical failure. The pilot circled the airport for hours to burn fuel before making what has been described as a textbook landing. 
footage shows the plane touching down and skidding along the tarmac until coming to a stop. Emergency response vehicles raced to help, but police say they were all okay on board and even were able to drive home. Let's end this tour of the world in Portugal, where on Sunday tens of thousands of Catholic pilgrims prayed for peace at the Fatima Shrine. Fatima has been one of the world's most popular pilgrimage sites for about 100 years now, since three Portuguese children claimed the Virgin Mary appeared and spoke to them three times. Every year, Catholic pilgrims from all over the world gather in Fatima, where they prayed for the Virgin Mary to end all wars. Well, let's hope that that works. Back to you, John. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Coming up, pack your bags. Summer travel season is almost here. Whether you're hitting the roads or hopping on a plane, we have everything you need to know to navigate what's expected to be a record-breaking Memorial Day travel weekend. We're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. The unofficial start of summer now just two weeks away. And if you're making plans to travel on Memorial Day weekend, you are most certainly not alone. Triple A says nearly 44 million travelers are expected to hit the road in the skies. That would make it one of the busiest weekends for travel in almost 20 years. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung joins us now from Reagan National Airport. We're going to make him stay there for the next two weeks. Just kidding. <laughs> Brian, so good morning. AAA says this is going to be one of the most crowded Memorial Day weekends at airports since 2005. So let's start with the airlines. How are they preparing? Yeah, I was going to say, I hope not, because I'm going to have to get a cot set up here at Reagan National. But either way, there are a lot of people expected to hit the skies on this Memorial Day weekend. 3.51 million Americans, that's how many AAA are expecting to fly. They're going to be headed likely to these popular destinations that they say will be on the tops of their list for travel. Like, for example, Orlando, Florida, trying to hit the theme parks there. Seattle, Washington, where a lot of those Alaskan cruises set off from, as well as New York, New York for all the obvious reasons. But uh, when it comes to just how the airlines are prepping, obviously you're going to have a lot of TSA officers trying to make sure they can handle the high volume because that is a nearly 5% increase from this time last year. And then you also do have a number of airlines that are continuing to try to promote deals to try to get people to fly for what it's worth. Airline ticket prices only up between 1% to 2%. Uh, it depends on, obviously, what route you're looking at, but hopefully that should be a little bit of extra change in your pockets that you can go and spend that Memorial Day weekend as people do try to make, it, make those plans uh, for two weekends from now, Joe. So most travelers are going to drive. Road trips expected to break a record, too. More than 38 million people plan to drive to their destinations. One thing they're thinking about, gas prices. So what are those prices looking like? Yeah, 38.4 million are expected to hit the roads. That, by the way, if it does come to fruition, would be the largest that AAA has seen in terms of drivers since it started collecting this data in 2000. But as far as gas prices, not going to be too much more expensive compared to last year. That's because gas prices are basically around the same right now, about $3.61 per gallon compared to about $3.54 uh, last year. Now, uh, when it does come to trying to plan ahead, of course, you do want to make sure you're also strategically planning the times that you go so that you don't get stuck in traffic. AAA does advise you want to leave Thursday or Friday uh, before uh, 10 a.m. or if or and when you're on your way back, making sure that you try to travel uh, before 1 p.m. on Sunday so you don't hit peak traffic, Joe. And AAA says Memorial Day, it's just the beginning. This is probably going to be a very busy summer travel season. So what should travelers keep in mind as they plan those summer vacations? Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to those uh, vacations, a lot of people are planning on cruising. So uh, in a survey alongside that uh, new data this morning, they did note that uh, over 70 percent of people say that they intend on taking a cruise at some point. Uh, so that does remain a hot tip type of ticket for summer travel. But again, when it comes to just driving for Memorial Day weekend, can't emphasize enough, you're going to want to travel your or, or rather plan your travel around not hitting that peak traffic. So again, try to leave in the morning if you're headed out for Memorial Day weekend and then try to head back earlier, uh, preferably before or the afternoon when you do try to make your way back to back home. All right, some good advice there, Brian. Thank you so much. Oprah Winfrey is now apologizing for what she says is her major role in diet culture. In a recent live stream, she admitted that she has been a steadfast participant in diet culture, both on her talk show and in her magazine over the last 25 years. Now, she says she wants to do better. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra has that story. I know we've been criticized, we've been scrutinized, we've been shamed. Oprah Winfrey is shedding the shame around weight. 
I have been a steadfast participant in this diet culture. Her apology about contributing to the toxic diet culture, part of a three hour long Weight Watchers special. A sobering moment for the icon who for decades was the face of the weight loss journey for millions, even as she herself was shamed in print and on TV. Pretty girl and you're single, you must lose the weight. I'm going to. Now pointing to that infamous moment in 1988 when she wheeled out a wagon of fat as her biggest regret. It is amazing to me that I can't lift it, but I used to carry it around every day. It sent a message that starving yourself with a liquid diet set a standard for people watching that I nor anybody else could uphold. Oprah wasn't just the face of weight loss. Who wants a taco? She spent 10 years as a Weight Watchers board member and director, but after intense speculation surrounding her suddenly slim figure on a December red carpet, Oprah became one of the first big name celebrities to come clean about using an unspecified weight loss drug, stepping down from the Weight Watchers board months later, now questioning the weight loss industry's future. What's the point of a Weight Watchers now? Do you think a special like what we saw on Thursday Day could have happened 20, 30 years ago? Oh, I don't think it would have ever taken flight. Obesity medicine physician Dr. Lori DiMattia has seen a major industry shift as certain drugs known for treating diabetes are now part of more weight loss journeys. Have you seen demand for weight loss drugs increase in the last couple of years? Oh, absolutely. The volume has increased substantially. The drugs come with uncertain long-term impacts, high costs for high demand, and criticism from use. Oprah taking the mic to say, while they're not for everyone, no one should be shamed for their choice. Weight health is a very complex issue for everybody. It is not one size fits all. Marissa Parra, NBC News. Joining us now to talk more about this is psychotherapist Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Good to have you with us. So. This is complicated, I think, because obviously Oprah is being very critical of things that she said in the past. At the same time, she did allow us to have these conversations, kind of removed some of the stigma. So explain the significance of a moment like this, especially with social media right now, perhaps impacting the way a lot of people view themselves. How important is it for us to have this conversation? Well, I think it's very generous of Oprah to come out in this way and share that she was a part of this diet culture, this idealized thinness and preoccupation with weight, when clearly she was also someone who was struggling with the messages from our culture as well. And basically what she's saying is, you know, focus on your health and that having weight issues is considered a disease and now is being treated as such as we know about Wagovi and Ozempic. It's more like high blood pressure or having high cholesterol. There's a medication that can help us lose the weight because it's not as simplistic as, you know, eating well and dieting. There are lots of different issues that go into being obese. So Oprah and some other big names have now admitted to taking these weight loss drugs. How is easier access to drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy impacting the ways we look at diet culture today, keeping in mind that still not everyone can access those drugs? Well, it reduces the shaming and blaming and also the negative self-talk that can happen in our diet culture. So it used to be if someone was obese, they were judged, they must be lazy, they don't care about how they look, when in fact, that's not necessarily the case. You know, there are a lot of different factors that go into being overweight or obesity. And I think people are coming around to understand, oh, there are lots of other reasons for being overweight. It's not about being lazy. It's not about being dedicated. There are a lot of things going on in my body that cr can create this, this medical state. So how can we, even as a society, deal with some of the pressures that maybe the unrealistic standards that can be the pillars of diet culture bring? Yes. So diet culture really is about thinness over health. And really, this conversation is helping us to understand it's really about health and well-being. And how can we find ways to be healthy in a long and uh, significant way that becomes almost a habit for us? 
and to surround ourselves with people who also are body positive in terms of well-being and thinking about health instead of extreme thinness as this ideal way of looking beautiful. So it's shifting the conversations in many ways, shifting how we talk to ourselves, how we think of ourselves, and also moving forward in healthy ways that has nothing to do with the number on the scale or right. less to do with it. Exactly. All right, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, thank you so much as always. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yesterday was an especially emotional Mother's Day for actress Olivia Munn, who's battling breast cancer while raising a young son. Now she's opening up about her ongoing fight and her hopes of having another child. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has more. Hey there. In March, Olivia Munn first shared publicly that she has been fighting an aggressive form of breast cancer for over a year. Well, yesterday in a new interview with Vogue, she revealed she had another major surgery in an attempt to save her life. In a poignant and powerful interview released on Mother's Day, actress Olivia Munn opening up to Vogue about her ongoing battle with breast cancer, including her desire to have another child with her partner, comedian John Mulaney. Munn revealing for the first time she has undergone a fifth surgery since the diagnosis, telling Vogue, I took out my uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. The 43-year-old newsroom star, who has already had a double mastectomy, explains her two-year-old son, Malcolm, was one of the reasons she wanted the hysterectomy, which would allow her to stop taking a powerful hormone suppression medication that left her completely exhausted and unable to cope with daily life, telling Vogue, it was a big decision to make, but it was the best decision for me because I needed to be present for my family. Adding, it's his childhood, but it's my motherhood, and I don't want to miss any of these parts if I don't have to. Mun also saying she hopes to grow her family with Mulaney, who shared a touching Mother's Day tribute on Instagram Sunday, writing, My son has the most incredible mommy, and he knows it. Munn telling Vogue that she froze her eggs prior to the latest surgery. And after learning we had two healthy embryos, John and I just started crying. She credits Dr. Thais Aliabadi for doing the breast cancer risk assessment test, which ultimately led to early detection. When it comes to breast cancer, we have really good treatments, but the key is to diagnose it early. For Mun, she's grateful for this time of healing. I'm proud of myself for, for what I went through. Mun also telling Vogue that a friend and fellow cancer survivor told her a year ago, you won't believe me now, but you're going to be happy you went through this one day. When the magazine asked Mun if the friend was right, she candidly admitted, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. Back to you. All right, Emily, thank you. Coming up, a nationwide call for accessible daycare. Thousands of parents and child care providers joining forces in the fight for higher wages and more affordable care. More on the effort to spark change next. We're back now with a growing call for more accessible child care. Today, many daycare centers and preschools across the country are actually going to close their doors as parents and educators join together to fight for higher wages and more affordable care. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans has the details. Hey there, many parents feel like they're priced out of daycare. At the same time for child care providers, they're struggling with low pay and high turnover. It adds up to a crisis brewing in child care. What do we want? This morning across the country, thousands of parents and child care providers are calling out of work or closing their doors for National Day Without Child Care, pressing lawmakers for affordable child care, including an expanded child tax credit and better pay for educators. The cost of care has skyrocketed. According to Bank of America, child care payments have soared 32 percent since 2019. Child care, the second biggest expense for working families after rent or mortgage. Care.com says the typical family spends nearly a quarter of its income on child care. Last year, 20 percent of parents reported shelling out at least $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year. That's much more than the average in-state college tuition, which runs just over $24,000 a year. Cora Holm is a single mother from Middleton, Wisconsin. She says she's only able to afford daycare for her four-year-old son, TJ, through a subsidized scholarship. There are a lot of people that are in worse, worse spots than I am. They might be forced 
to put their child in hands that are not qualified. Today, Cora is taking the day off from her job to support the walkout at TJ School, part of a National Day Without Child Care organized by the group Community Change Action in 26 states. Our teachers make anywhere from minimum wage to $20 an hour. Christine Svihovic is an enrollment coordinator at an early learning center in Mount Sinai, New York, where tuition can run up to two grand a month. Christine says parents are strapped by rising tuition and educators face low pay and high turnover. Parents need care for their children, but if they band with us, it will help them and, and, their, and their teachers as well. Unlike the K-12 school system, for most families, daycare is largely left up to parents and child care providers. Teacher turnover is high. There are long wait lists at many centers. And emergency COVID funding used to boost wages in many states is starting to run out. Infant child care can run up to $15,000 a year in some places, which just becomes impossible math for so many families. Back to you. All right, Christine Romans, thank you. Sticking with your wallet, between court dates, Mr. Trump is on the campaign trail trying to woo voters with some big money promises. CNBC's Bertha Coombs has a closer look at that and some other dollar sign headlines. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Maybe taxes will be a big campaign issue. Donald Trump says he'll double down on his upper class tax cut if he wins a second term as president. At a rally in New Jersey this weekend, the former president said he'll instate broad tax cuts, including for the upper class and businesses. Those comments creating a real contrast with President Biden, who has said he would eliminate tax cuts that benefit households earning more than $400,000 and would raise taxes on rich Americans and large corporations. Of course, both of them or either of them would need Congress to really move forward. Speaking of which, a federal judge has blocked a new rule from the Biden administration that would cap credit card late fees at $8. The Fifth Circuit judge in Texas granted a preliminary injunction to several business and banking groups that argue that the rule violates federal statutes. Now, the rule was set to go into effect tomorrow, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau estimates that it would save consumers about $10 billion a year year. But that ruling now puts the plan on hold until a hearing is held. And Donald Glover, also known as his alter ego, Childish Gambino, dropped a surprise album last night after months of teasing new music. The album is called Ata Vista and is largely a revamped version of the one that Glover released four years ago. Ata Vista features new production arrangements, new guests, and actual song titles titles as opposed to the original timestamps that marked the tracks. I guess this is Donald's version or Childish Gambino's version? Right. <laughs> kind of an interesting revamp. It is. Well, good for him, and I'm sure a lot of fans are excited about that one. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. All right, now to the news that's got fast food lovers in a bit of a frenzy. McDonald's is working on a new value meal that includes some of the menu's most popular items, for just five bucks. That could bring some relief to the drive through lane and to wallets across the country. Recently, many diners have taken to social media to call out rising fast food prices. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra joins us now with more on how McDonald's might be looking to take a bite out of the competition. Marissa, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. I mean, everybody at this point has seen those viral videos of people complaining about how some items can run you $20 depending on the fast food restaurant. So now McDonald's is exploring a new combo meal that could keep customers full and their wallets lean. For an eight count mini and a lemonade, $14? Are you kidding me? with fast food frustration frying customers. What happened to the dollar menu? Bring that back. This morning, some relief may be on the horizon of the Golden Arches. McDonald's may soon roll out a $5 value meal nationwide. Two people familiar tell CNBC the offer would include four-piece chicken McNuggets, a choice of a McChicken or McDouble, fries and a drink. And the rumor hot off the press has consumers loving it. Because that seems too good to be true. I'm excited for it if that's the case because 
everything is expensive now. The fast food giant would be just the latest to offer a $5 meal deal. And get all this with the JBC for just five bucks. Igniting a battle in the Burger Kingdom as more inflation cautious consumers are fed up with rising fast food costs. $4 for one sandwich? How are we supposed to survive? When did McDonald's get so expensive? Analysis from Finance Buzz found the price of a quarter pounder with cheese meal at McDonald's has doubled in the past 10 years, while Popeyes, Taco Bell, and Jimmy John's have raised prices by more than 60%. McDonald's says the report is not an accurate representation and notes pricing is set by each franchisee. But overall, dining out is 4.2% more expensive now compared to this time last year. With customers eating elsewhere and states hiking up minimum wage, like California now paying fast food workers $20 an hour, McDonald's saw profits decline for the first time in years. McDonald's is losing a lot of customers. A value offer that brings customers in the door keeps revenue flowing. Now restaurants need to stay creative to lure hungry customers back with deals that appeal to both their stomachs and their wallets. So the natural question is, when would we see this $5 value meal roll out? Well, it depends. It still needs to get approved, so it could still take some time. And for reference, a similar effort failed earlier this year. So we'll see what happens. But Joe, I want to show you something. Here are all of the items that would come with that value meal. This is from here at our local Miami shop, and this would run you about $15. So just to give you an idea of that savings, that $5 value meal would save you about $10. So $10 cheaper than what I spent this morning, Joe. But at least we'll have a happy crew in just a few minutes. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. I will be quiet now so the food doesn't get cold and everyone can enjoy it. Marissa, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Coming up one on one with the head of the WNBA. After the break, Commissioner Kathy Engelbert opens up about the league's growing fan base, the pay gap between the WNBA and the NBA, and the rising interest in women's sports. Stay with us. You are watching Morning News Now. Welcome back over the weekend. The 35th annual Glad Media Awards happened right here in New York. Our series Flipping the Script was among the nominees this year, up for outstanding live TV journalism. This is me with our producers, Anna and Tyler, at the ceremony on Saturday. We didn't take home the award, but it was, of course, an honor to be nominated among so many amazing media professionals and artists. That includes NBC News reporter Jay Valle and his colleagues at NBC Out for their coverage of New York City gay bar deaths classified as homicides. That segment, which won, aired right here on NBC News Now. EGOT winner Jennifer Hudson and country singer Orville Peck were the big honorees of the night. Hudson was presented with the Excellence in Media Award, while Peck received the Vito Russo Award. Now, apart from all the pomp and circumstance and my shiny sequin suit, this night is really about honoring work that promotes visibility and inclusivity. A huge congratulations to everyone who was involved. It was an amazing evening. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.